Anything else? Um, yeah, that the uh, the seeds that are sown would just take root and would go down deep. Just bless this time we have together. Uh, bless the fellowship and just the conversation. God, uh, we love you and pray all these things in your name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we just want to welcome everybody. Hope you're all having a good evening. And uh, we're just going to give a little introduction to the course. And then we're going to have a big uh, group discussion. Then we're going to go into some of the content. And then we're going to have another discussion. So there's going to be uh, interactive components to this course. And then at the end, we're going to get into smaller groups and be able to share in a more intimate setting. Okay, so uh, with all that said, we're going to try to finish by eight o'clock. We went maybe about two, three minutes over uh, in the morning class, but uh, it was really good. Just to give you a heads up of what we're going to talk about for the next eight weeks, we are uh, going over the Acts Church, or we're diving into the Acts Church because we want an impartation of what they have carried. And so week one, we're going to talk about the Spirit-Filled Church, and that's today. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about the Supernatural Church. Week three is Ascending Church, and all of this is in the syllabus that you would have received if you registered. We're going to talk about the Salad Church, the diversity of the early church. We're going to talk about the Spirit-Led Church, the Small Church, uh, the Sanctified Church, and the Spiritual Warfare Church. All right, like I mentioned before, we're going to utilize the chat a lot here. So I'm going to put a lot of the um, verses and quotes and main points in the chat. Okay. So here we go. Here is our first quote that I just want us to look at. It comes from James Montgomery Boyce. And here's his introduction to the book of Acts. He says, humanly speaking, Christianity had nothing going for it. It had no money, no proven leaders, no technological tools for propagating the gospel, and it faced enormous obstacles. It was utterly new. And by the way, back then they valued that which was in antiquity. And uh, it taught truths that were incredible to the unregenerate world. When we hear incredible, we think, oh, it was amazing. But he's saying it was not credible to the unregenerate world. And it was subject to the most intense hatreds and persecutions. So that is what the first church was up against. Here is a quote from Bart Ehrman. He's one of the most well-known agnostics, actually. He uh, was once a Christian, but now he's written many books, uh, basically, um, you know, sharing a, a different kind of Christianity, more from the historical lens, but he's not a believer anymore. But this is what he writes in his book, uh, The Triumph of Christianity. He says, Christianity is a religion whose first believers were 20 or so illiterate day laborers in a remote part of the empire that became the official religion of Rome, converting some 30 million people in just four centuries. Wow, that is rapid church growth. And here, this is the most powerful one that I want us to look at. And we're going to talk about this right after we read this. And it's in the chat. It comes from A.W. Tozer. And he says, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on. And no one would know the difference. Wow. Let's just think about that for a little bit. But if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop. So 95% of the book of Acts would have been ripped out or wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. And everyone would know the difference. So here is the question that I want to bring to us today as we get ready to talk about the Spirit-filled church. It'll be in the chat, but how would church be different if the Holy Spirit withdrew from it. Let's just talk about our local church. What do you think would still work? What would still fly? What would still be intact and even successful? And mm -hmm. what just wouldn't work at all? What wouldn't cut it? So yeah, let's go ahead and um, you know, unmute our mics if you wanna to contribute to this, but how would the church be different if the Holy Spirit withdrew? from it what would work 
and what wouldn't work anymore? Well, speaking for myself anyway, um, I can think back to when I was seven years old and we left the church. Um, I'm still a little fuzzy on all the details, but Holy Spirit has revealed it a bunch to me, which I will leave out because it's got nothing to do with this. But the church itself, I remember, it was not a Holy Spirit led church. There was teachings, there was talking, there wasn't a whole lot of participation. Um, there was the knowledge and there was the historical aspect, but there was no spontaneity. And it, it was just one person up at the front, like just kind of talking at us. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. So there would just be content, mm -hmm. but not power. I'm seeing in the chat here, and feel free to answer this in the chat as well. Uh, Tim writes, no unity in the church because it's the Holy Spirit that produces unity, huh? A anybody else want to give it a shot? Would we still have great music? Maybe. <laughs> Would we still have good media? Probably. Could we still have excellent marketing and marketing that works? Yeah. I think so. Would there be a singles ministry? I don't think so. Singles ready to mingle? <laughs> you know, it doesn't take the power of the Holy Spirit necessarily to grow a big organization. So could it be large without the Holy Spirit? But yeah, anybody else want to chime in? I don't want to answer for you. So um, anybody else want to contribute to this question? Well, How we want Holy Spirit be different. Yeah, go for it, Jeannie. Um, we wouldn't see the Holy Spirit moving in power when we pray for somebody. We wouldn't see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit at all. Right. So that would not be good. <laughs> anybody else? We probably wouldn't even be praying for people. If we didn't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, or at least not effectively. Yeah. Maybe a lot of hot air and bad breath. Um, anybody yeah. else? No discernment. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, because he's a spirit of truth. Anybody else? What would happen if the Holy Spirit departed? What would still work? And what wouldn't work? Personally, now that I think about it, um, like with Holy Spirit, you, you do need to be surrendered. And like I said, there wouldn't be any discernment. And I think it might look, in, in my honest opinion, it might look more political than anything else. Amen. Mm. I think That's there right. wouldn't be conviction, would there? Because the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Nope. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Maybe let's just take another 30 seconds here and be feel legalistic. free to put it in the chat. Mary? It would be legalistic. Mm, right. What's going on? Good. Because you can still give people commandments and rules. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that there'll be power to fulfill it. I would say that we wouldn't have the same level of unity because right. just as if you have any large organization, any group, uh, just by the passage of time, there are going to be just some arguments, some conflicts that naturally develop. You know, that's just human nature. Right. But with the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit binds all of our hearts together. So there can be full reconciliation. Uh, you know, there can be a resolution of those conflicts and agreements. So if we didn't have the Holy Spirit, there would be uh, not nearly the same sense of unity. Mm. I see here, David wrote, the programs would still run. That's yeah. right. Probably most of them. Yeah. Very good, everybody. Yeah, feel free to continue to put it in the chat if you have an answer to that. But Jesus began his ministry after the Holy Spirit came upon him. We see this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, that Jesus is being baptized and the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and everything jesus did was by the power of the holy spirit and by the leadership of the holy spirit that's why even in acts chapter 1 verse 2 it says that he through the holy spirit gave commandments so everything jesus did was through the holy spirit but jesus promised that the holy spirit would come upon his disciples so i'll put it in the chat acts chapter 1 now verse 4 to 5 and being uh, assembled with them, 
he commanded them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus was saying, as the Holy Spirit came on me, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, but you have to wait. Uh, let's talk about that word wait. Wait means that our patience will be tested. For those disciples, it ended up being 10 days. And not all of them waited. Some of them got discouraged. I believe the others of them got offended. And that still keeps us from having the more powerful encounters with God as we get discouraged and we get offended. But the 120 disciples that waited, uh, they experienced this baptism of the Holy Spirit. But we see that the Holy Spirit's not a vending machine. A vending machine you put in a quarter and, or, or two or three, and then you get what you want instantly. But no, the Holy Spirit, we need to wait for him, and he comes when he wills. So we've all been in gatherings, I think, when we experience the Holy Spirit coming like a mighty rushing wind, right? And, and everyone is filled in such a tangible, evident way. I remember doing some uh, youth uh, rallies or youth revivals in, in this country and even in other countries. And the Holy Spirit would come so powerfully. The nights would go to 1 or 2 a.m. and nobody wanted to leave. They're on the floor having encounters with God. And then I've been in other meetings where we're waiting, <laughs> where we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. So there's a time to wait and there's a time to receive. How many of you love to wait? I mean, I don't like waiting. I don't like traffic. But during the wait, God does a work in us. Our character is being refined. During the wait, our inferior desires are being dethroned. Uh, during the wait, our trust muscles or our faith is being built up. So waiting is not a bad thing. You study the lives of the great men and women of God in scripture. They all had seasons of waiting before the promise was fulfilled or before the breakthrough happened or before the promotion took place. So waiting is not a bad thing. And uh, we see here Jesus is saying wait because you can't manufacture it. You can't uh, conjure it up yourself. You have to receive it. Um, you know, an analogy would be we can't make the wind blow, but we, what we can do is raise the sail and wait for the wind to blow. And the way we raise our sail to receive the wind of the Holy Spirit is through desire and expectation. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, I'll go ahead and put it in the chat. But Jesus said, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So as we desire and expect our father to give us the Holy Spirit, uh, we are raising the sail and now in position to receive. And now Jesus talks about the baptism with the Holy Spirit and baptism speaks of immersion. And in the natural, when somebody is baptized, they know that they were baptized. So when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, there won't be questions about it. We will know that we know that we know that it happened. And you know, when somebody is baptized, especially in our church, when we dunk them in the jacuzzi or at the beach, everybody else can see that they were immersed in the water. And when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, not only will we know, but the people around us will know that something happened to us. I remember there was a young man who served with me when I was a youth pastor and he was our worship leader. And one night he got so baptized with the Holy Spirit that his worship leading changed overnight. I mean, it went up like 50 notches. And when he's leading, he's pu pulling us all into heaven. And he didn't have that before. Now, look with me in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 here. Uh, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Jesus saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. Uh, and here they're asking Jesus about the destiny of Israel when Jesus had been talking to them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that Jesus says, hey, don't worry about that. Don't waste your time and energy worrying about the things that God's going to handle. Spend your time, energy, and focus desiring the Holy Spirit. 
And this is really powerful because here's Jesus's response in verse seven and eight. He says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the father has put in authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. You know why they wanted to see, um, you know, Israel restored to prominence was because that makes them look good. They were all Jews and they wanted to see uh, Rome dethroned and expelled. They were tired of living under Roman occupation. There was a shame there and they wanted their country to be successful. And here Jesus is saying, don't worry about looking successful on the outside. You need the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside. The Father will determine some of these things on the outside, but you need the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside. Here, they want their country to look good because their country reflects them, and they want their country to look good because they want to look good. But Jesus is saying, no, it's not about you looking good on the outside. It's about you being filled with the Holy Spirit on the inside. And I think, you know, as pastors, as leaders, or whatever you do professionally, we want to look good on the outside. We want to be successful on the outside. We, you know, we, we want to appear like we're winning. And yet, I don't think that should be the priority. The priority is we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit on the inside. Uh, and as the Jews, they wanted political power, military power uh, for the Romans to be overpowered. <laughs> But Jesus was promising them another kind of power. It was the Spirit's power, power from above, power from the kingdom of God, power from heaven, power that makes us more like Jesus, and power that allows us to reveal Jesus to our world. It's a power that makes us more humble and more loving. And uh, you know what I love about this? Jesus told them that they will be witnesses. Uh, he didn't say they have to try to be a witness. He says, you just get the Holy Spirit, and by default, you will be a witness. Uh, consequently, you'll be a witness. He didn't say you got to take a class on witnessing or, or you got to read 10 books on evangelism. He said, you get filled with the Holy Spirit, and next thing you know, you're going to be revealing Jesus to others by accident. Uh, you're going to be a witness. A witness is someone who brings the reality of something to another. I'm going to put that in the chat. A witness is someone who brings the reality of something to another. And we're supposed to bring the reality of Jesus Christ to our world. Hey, I heard a really funny story. And I thought it was kind of cute. But there was this 20-something-year-old uh, Bible college student, and he was so gifted. He was super intelligent. He was well-read. He was uh, extremely eloquent. And uh, he, he was sent on a mission to do some open-air preaching from the Bible college. And he was paired up with um, his mother-in-law. So here he is. He's, you know, 20-something. He's strong. Uh, he can speak. He's intelligent. And here's his mother-in-law, who's not cool. She is not cool. She's just this middle-aged lady who uh, is not as educated as he is, is not as charismatic as he is. So he goes up in front of everybody and just starts preaching and people are rolling their eyes. They're walking past him. Uh, they're just, they can care less about what he's doing. And then his mother-in-law goes in front of all the people and then she just begins talking about Jesus and people are gathering and tears are rolling down their eyes. You know, people are so drawn to this uh, middle-aged woman. And as she's speaking, uh, you know, th there's just this hunger and they want to know Jesus. Repentance starts breaking out and he is perplexed. He's scratching his head saying, wait, 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 wait. She can't even speak. She's not even a good communicator. Uh, you know, hey, why aren't they listening to me? But what he realized was on the way to the slum areas where they would do the open air preaching while he would be studying and, you know, writing his notes, reviewing his notes. She would just be talking to God in a mysterious language the whole time. And he realized that she had something in the Holy Spirit that he didn't have. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's when we become witnesses. And here's what happened when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Acts chapter two, verse one. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they're all with one accord in one place. Uh, there's this corporate seeking. And hey, class, I believe that's what we're doing together. We are corporately seeking the Holy Spirit and more of the Holy Spirit together. 
And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them tongues, divided tongues as a fire and sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Just to give you some background on the day of Pentecost, that's the day that the Israelites received the law, but the law demands, the law doesn't empower, but the Holy Spirit empowers us. And we needed more than demands. We needed empowerment. And we see that the Holy Spirit comes uh, not according to their timeline, not when they willed, when he wills. You know, when it comes to receiving the Holy Spirit, it's not like there's a formula, you know, where you say Jesus four times, you say Heavenly Father two times, you say come Holy Spirit, you know, eight times. And that's kind of the code that you punch in and then instantly you get baptized the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. We see that what is necessary is just raising the sail or having a seeking heart. And often we see that the Holy Spirit falls on people when they seek after God while having a unity of heart. And we'll see that again in Acts chapter four. But here, uh, the mighty rushing wind comes. And I love that because in Ezekiel 37, verse nine and 10, we see that the Spirit of God is the breath of God and is the wind of God. And wherever the breath of God brings that wind, uh, then there is life that is experienced. Revival is the result. Uh, the, the wind of God came upon the dry bones. And as God breathed upon those dry bones, they were revived and they had new life and strength. And that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And this wind is not from earth. It's it's from heaven. It's from another realm. And I love how it's a mighty rushing wind because a mighty rushing wind will move whatever it's in its way. So when I read that, I, I just imagine the person that's saying, well, I, I don't really care for God. I don't even think I believe in God. Uh, and boom, you know, they get hit by that wind. <laughs> and I, I, I've seen that. I'm sure you've seen that. But man, when the Holy Spirit moves, um, he's going to move people. He's going to move people. Uh, we also see that there's tongues of fire. Um, John the Baptist prophesied that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's Matthew 3.11. And fire is a purifying agent. Fire purifies. Uh, and we need the purifying work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Remember when Isaiah the prophet realized that he had unclean lips? What happened was an angel took a, a fiery coal from heaven and touched his lips with it. And uh, that's what we need. We need the Holy Spirit to touch us, to change the way we talk. Because according to James, in James chapter 3, verse 4, if God can get a hold of your tongue, he can get a hold of your life. When he gets a hold of our mouths, he can get a hold of our lives. Because our tongue is the rudder that directs us. And we, we also know about uh, words and the tongue and speech and jesus says this in luke chapter 6 verse 45 that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so when we see that their tongues were on fire the tongue is simply the overflow of the heart so their hearts were on fire being purified by the spirit of god and uh we, we also see that fire is a picture of passion and when the holy spirit fills us when we're baptized with the holy spirit we're going to be burning with passion in our hearts for God and for people to know God. Uh, a spirit-filled, passive Christian is an oxymoron. When somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, passion is inevitable. I remember I had just the word of God in my bones. like It was like fire in my bones. And I just had to tell somebody about the Lord. And I, I'm sure many of you experienced that as well. There's just a burning passion in our hearts for others to know God. Okay, let's keep reading. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and my prayer is, God, do it again. Do it in us. We, we want your fire. And, uh, and, and they began to speak with other tongues that the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And uh, he, here's something interesting. When they heard this sound occur and this multitude came together, they were confused because they heard everyone speaking in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled saying, look, are these not all who speak Galilean? How is it that we hear them each in our own language in which we were born? And uh, you know, they heard them speaking about the wonderful works of God 
And in verse 13, it says, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? But others mocked that they were full of new wine. Hey, you know, church, I, I believe that the Acts church was not afraid of being confusing. They were willing to uh, leave others perplexed. And they weren't just trying to make everybody comfortable. Uh, they, they didn't hide the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the back closet. No, you know, um, they, they were going to just release the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for all to see. And yeah, people were perplexed. People were confused. But they were also amazed. And we're later going to see that they were convicted. And they would come to Christ and experience salvation. And so I, I think, you know, there's this temptation for us to try to make everybody comfortable. Let's try to make sure everything makes sense to everyone. But that's not us being true ambassadors of the kingdom of God. You know, we're supposed to be aliens on this earth. And I, I wrote this down in my notes. I'd rather be a little spunky than stagnant. I'd rather be weird. I'd rather be the weird church than the boring church. I, I, I rather be perplexing yet powerful instead of being predictable and powerless. And, you know, this church, they were made fun of. They were mocked because they weren't ashamed of the Holy Spirit. And yet what was the fruit? We're later going to read that 3,000 people came to Jesus Christ. That's the fruit. And I, I love how they, <laughs> anyway, Amen to that. If, you, if, you, if you're getting fired up about it, just write amen in the chat there. I mean, I want to say amen to that. We want to be a powerful church. Um, perplexing, probably. Uh, confusing, yeah, maybe at times. But we want to see God move through us. And we want to have impact on planet Earth. I think we can water everything down and, you know, play everything safe. And, uh, you know, just try to you know, get to everybody where, where, where they're at and to their level that we never call them higher. We get to their level and we never call them higher. No, I think they need to see heaven invade earth. They need to get a taste of another realm. Uh, amen. But anyway, um, here we see that they are now talking about the greatness of God. Uh, they're talking about how wonderful God is. And I believe that that's the evidence that somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit, is they're not talking about themselves all the time anymore, because they're not thinking about themselves all the time anymore. You know, the Holy Spirit makes us so God conscious, less self conscious, less uh, people conscious, where now we don't have the fear of man, because the fear of the Lord displaced the fear of man. And, and, you know, I, when I read this, I say, man, I want to be somebody who's so full of the Holy Spirit that I'm not bragging about myself and I'm not even just bragging about people, but I'm bragging about God all the time. And, and I believe that's what the Holy Spirit accomplishes in us. So we see here in Acts 2, three metaphors of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat. We talked about wind, the breath of God that brings revival, moves whatever is in its way. We see fire. Fire brings purification. Fire speaks of passion. And now they're saying that they're full of new wine. We see wine as a metaphor of the Holy Spirit. Now, when it comes to wine, we can't live off of or we can't stay intoxicated uh, off of, you know, last week's drink. You know, and when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we need to be filled over and over again. And the, the Holy Spirit allows us to be who we were really meant to be. Yeah, the Holy Spirit causes the true self in us to surface. You know, I remember reading about how when in the Old Testament it talks about the Holy Spirit came upon King Saul and turned him into another man. And it says it turned him into another man. But when I read that, I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me, but hey, you know, for you, for all of us in this new covenant, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he just makes you who you really are. He allows you to live out your true identity and who you are in Christ Jesus. Um, but, but we see that we need to be filled over and over again. 
So in Acts chapter 4, and this is a few years after Acts chapter 2, the church is praying together in one accord. I think, man, if we want to be a spirit-filled church, we're going to have to be people who can gather together and seek God in one accord, in one heart. And so in Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 24, we see that they are seeking God with one heart, and they're raising their voices to God, and they're asking for signs and wonders to be done in the name of Jesus. And then it says that the place that they prayed was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness, with boldness. That's what the Holy Spirit accomplishes. The Holy Spirit helps us get over ourselves, <laughs> over our fears, so that we can be who he's calling us to be. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, this will be the last scripture we look at before we have another big group discussion here. But we see that we're not supposed to get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you study what those words mean in the Greek, it means to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, here, I'll read it from the message translation. It says, don't drink too much wine that cheapens your life. Drink the spirit of God, huge drafts of him. So we need to be filled over and over with the Holy Spirit, more and more, over and over and more and more. Uh, sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything, any excuse uh, for a song to God the Father in the name of of our master, Jesus Christ, as we continue to seek God, as we continue to worship and pray in the spirit, worship in the spirit, we get continually filled. And I just love how we see the early church gathering together to be filled with the Holy Spirit because they had nothing else. They had no other way that they could survive. <laughs> there, there was, they weren't depending on anything else. You know, They weren't depending on their church buildings. They weren't depending on their church programs. Uh, they weren't depending on their natural gifting, their ability to speak or sing or play the drums or strum the guitar or mix on the soundboard. Uh, they weren't depending on their marketing strategies. They knew they needed the Holy Spirit. And so I want to ask us this question. Why are we not more dependent on the Holy Spirit? So this is a group discussion here. So feel free to answer in the chat or unmute your mic and share but why are we not more dependent on the spirit's power and how can we be more dependent on the spirit's power as you're uh, preparing your answers i just want to share about a, a meeting i had with a pastor uh, two weeks ago over breakfast and he pastored a few very large churches uh, one of them uh, is in our area and uh and he recently said, I have neglected the Spirit's power, and I was wrong for it, and I want to be more dependent on the Holy Spirit. So I asked him, hey, why did you say that? Why were you not dependent on the Holy Spirit? And basically, his answer was, because I'm really smart. <laughs> because he was saying that uh, I figured out how to move people. I figured out how to run an organization effectively and efficiently and even successfully. So I didn't need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I didn't need to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was saying, I was wrong. And I think, man, if we're not depending on the Holy Spirit, we're, I think we're missing the point. I think we're missing the point. It's like playing a guitar without strings. I mean, we're, we're just missing the point here. Um, but yeah, I, I see great answers here in the chat. Um, too many distractions, our flesh, depending on our own strength, unbelief, uh, comfort, overthinking, pride. Uh, anybody else? Why are we not more dependent on the Holy Spirit? And the other side of that question is, what would it look like if we were more dependent on the Holy Spirit? What would that look like? Anybody want to contribute here? Why are we not more dependent on the Holy Spirit? 
And how can we be more dependent on the Holy Spirit? Pardon me. If well, we were more dependent, we would see more breakthroughs. Yeah, go for it, Tim. You know, the, the Spirit is unpredictable. You know, we like to go through the drive through at McDonald's because we know what they have to offer and we can order what we're looking for. The Spirit, when we go through the drive through of the Holy Spirit, he wants to tell us what he has for us. And we're not always wanting to hear that. We're, we think we know what we need. So part of it is just, you know, we, we don't know that we can trust the Spirit, that the Spirit's going to show up in the timely fashion as we think we need it. So that unpredictability of the Spirit you know, kind of limits our first option of going to the spirit and waiting and being patient, because that's the second part of it is waiting on God and truly having faith that he knows what we need and he will provide it. That that requires a lot of faith because it's it's not something that we can control. And if we put ourselves in the hands of God, we have to be ready for God's answer, which may be something we're not looking for. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, uh, uh, I, mean, I think it's the Holy Spirit, that, the Holy Spirit that brings us through the process of sanctification. And part of the sanctification that is dying to self. So, so a lot of times that that's really not that comfortable, but but the ultimate end is being the being being one with with the Holy Spirit, being one with the Lord, and being comfortable in that position. It, it, and the more that you walk with the Holy Spirit, the closer you are, and and, and the better your understanding of 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 the hope that of the calling that you have uh, through Him and what He wants you to do, and it's all good. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Gary, for your contributions here. And I'm seeing so much um, <laughs> rich content in the chat as well. Um, I, I had a friend share this article. And in that article, it talked about how passion dies in marriage. And they said that the more couples spend time together without engaging one another, so maybe just on their devices or doing separate things, it actually begins to kill the passion in that relationship. And it just made me think about our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Like he's with us, he's in us, but do we engage him? Do we engage him? Um, you know, I, I love what you said there. Um, who, who, who was that? I, I, um, I'm pulling it up. Somebody, uh, I think it was Nora, you said in the chat, we need classes like this to uh, remind us and to keep us accountable. Let's be people who really depend on the Holy Spirit. Amen to that. Uh, Meg Brooks says, spending time alone with God, that uh, shows that we are depending on the Holy Spirit. Um, and Debbie says the same thing. I think we need to spend more time with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, engaging the Holy Spirit uh, through personal time uh, we place aside for him. Uh, that, that's so good. That's so good. And, and I think, you know, a lot of times we're just depending on our own strength and then we run out of strength. Um, all right. Wonderful. Hey, we're going to get into our groups in a little bit, but here's the question that we're going to talk about in our breakout groups is that, uh, do you believe that you were baptized with the Holy Spirit? And uh, can you share about it? How did it happen? And how did your life change? And now we're, we're not here to shame anybody. This is a judgment-free zone. And so if you feel like you've not experienced uh, such a, a phenomena, it's okay to admit that you, you don't think you've experienced it yet. And, you know, you're still probably in that waiting time and, and we love you. And, you know, it doesn't make you uh, inferior. You know, you're still extremely valuable and loved by God. And we love you here. But um, I just wanted to ask you um, that question, because as we share in our groups, I think we'll fire each other up. Some of us, we need to go back to our own stories of when we were baptized with the Holy Spirit. We need to revisit some of our own encounters 
with God. And so I want to give you opportunity to do that uh, in the breakout groups. We got about maybe 15 minutes at uh, the chat in our group. So I know you may have the 20 minute version or you may have the three minute version. I want you to share the, the three minute version here of uh, when you believe you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, how did it happen and, and what changed in your life uh, and what changed in your life? Okay, so I'll, I'll send that question again. Uh, and then at the end of the 15 minutes, whoever wants to kind of come back to this room and hang out for a little bit, we can go ahead and do so. Just want to thank everybody for being in this first class. There were 27 of us here. And, um, you know, that's so cool. In the morning we had, I, I think, close to 20. So I, I'm just uh, excited because I believe we're supposed to receive something as a church through this. So let's go ahead and get into our rooms and just share about our story. And if you don't have a story, it's okay. We can listen to other people's stories and be encouraged that way and be inspired. Um, all right. So we're going to go ahead into our breakout groups. Hey, David, do you see that option uh, for breakout groups? Yeah, right. it's under uh, more. All right, cool. So we're going to go into five groups here. So uh, yeah, please accept the invitation to go to the breakout group and uh, we're gonna really be able to share in a, for about 15 minutes here. Hey Galena. Hi, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Oh, do you see an invitation to join a group? No. There I don't be. see that. Okay. David, is there a way we can manually put Galena in a group? Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I put her into group three. Oh, now she's back. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me see. I'm gonna try to put 